Good morning. We thank and praise God for this opportunity to be here on today. Honor and respect to Pastor Meredith, Dr. Felker, and Sister Felker. We hope and pray that things are going well for you all on today, as well as to our trustee chair, our Sister Gloria Williams, and Brother Eugene Williams. Uh, we hope that the report continues to be well for you, Brother Williams, uh, on today. And then to our chairman of our deacon ministry, Deacon Warren Irby, God bless you. Uh, we hope and pray that you are continuing to do well. Uh, we thank God for all the times that you guys log in and share with us and then even respond to our group texts about the well-being of the other members of our congregation. And we appreciate you all for that. For those of you who have taken the time out to come in and be with us in person, as well as those of you that are online to be with us. Who oh, is good to be back. It's good to be back in the salon and be back with you all uh, as we are continuing to head down uh, toward the close of our study of Ecclesiastes. There's only 12 chapters, but there's a lot in them, and we're hoping uh, that what's in them has been helpful for you. Uh, when we talk about the topic of questioning our faith uh, in a confusing world, because surely, brothers and sisters, as we live in this world in which we live in, there's so much going on. It looks like the more that we get, the more information, the more television we watch, the more news that we hear, it seems like the more confusing the world gets. You know, it, it was so interesting to me. I had a gentleman uh, share with me the other day. He shared with me uh, what I like to call a did you know. And I was like, a did you know? He said, yeah. He said, Pastor Jones, did you know that uh, if you were a convicted felon, you couldn't run for mayor of a city? I said, oh, okay. He said, well, if you're a convicted felon, you can't run for alderman of a city. I said, is that right? He said, if you, as a matter of fact, the only office you can run for and be a convicted felon is for President of the United States. And I said, now, if that's not a confusing world, I don't know what is. Okay, and that's just the tip of the iceberg when we talk about the things that are happening in our confusing world that can cause us to question our faith. Uh, for those of you that may be new with us and for those of you that have been with us for a while, you know, uh, we've been sharing uh, the words of Solomon. And uh, everything is going to be one page today. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, no, 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 uh, no back pages today. All right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I saw you. I saw you doing that. And so, uh, and Solomon, uh, we come to know as uh, the wisest man uh, that ever lived, uh, as uh, his credit has been given to him. But we also come to realize, and it was shared when we first started this study. Uh, boy, to be a wise man, he sure made some kind of crazy decisions. And you know, and uh, I believe that uh, something that my grandparents used to say. Uh, kind of gave credence to uh, what caused Solomon to fall into the uh, quagmire that he did, and that is being an educated fool. Okay, sometimes our education can get us in trouble. And one of the things that uh, Solomon caused himself to do was to, to overthink his life and his relationship with God to the point that he began to say, well, you know, uh, I'm doing well. I think I can do this without God. And uh, he actually tried to do that. And then he also found himself looking at the confusing world, a world in which we look at as well, and begin to have some of his doubts as it relates to how God acts or how God does not act or how things are or how things should be. And, and you know, and before we're too hard on Solomon, <clears throat> we come to understand that uh, many of us, uh, many of our friends and loved ones, and perhaps at some time even ourselves have felt that way. And so what we're, we're gonna get into this study uh, on today and bring us up to speed and, uh, and then share some new things with you as well. Now, from our last time together, uh, uh, as we see how living in this confusing world can cause us to make questionable decisions as well as question our faith, we've seen that up to this point. So now, having said that, let's look again at verse 4 of chapter 11 in Ecclesiastes. And we're going we're gonna to pick up right here in chapter 11, if you have your Bibles with you, chapter 11 of Ecclesiastes. We're going to pick up that and go right into... Uh, getting ready to go into chapter 12. But let's look again at verse 4 of chapter 11 of Ecclesiastes. It reads like this. And this is the uh, New American Standard Bible. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Good morning. Uh, there's, yeah, there's a couple outlines right there. Oh, one who watches the wind will not sow, and one who looks at the clouds will not harvest. Now, verse 4 uh, speaks of the farmer who constantly worries about the weather waiting for just the right time or the perfect circumstances to plant or harvest. Now, I want to kind of jump the gun here because 
when you think of something like that, sometimes when it comes to evangelism or outreach, we do the same thing. Well, you know, it's too cold to go out. We wait till it get warm. Oh, it's too cloudy. It looks like it's about to rain. Maybe we better not do it. Okay, and here comes one we're getting ready to hear now. Well, you know, it's pretty hot out there, <laughs> you know, and, you know, we don't want to go out there while it's pretty hot. And before we know it, if you're not careful, the whole season or the whole opportunity is missed. And so, and all of that stems from this farming example uh, that uh, Solomon gives uh, on page two. So let's take a look. Uh, he gives these questionable excuses, uh, which a farmer tends to give. If it's too windy, one would not go out to sow or plant seeds. If it looks like rain, one would not go out to reap the harvest. If one waits too long for any of those things, they'll miss the opportunity to sow seeds, and then, of course, they have nothing to harvest. Okay, so you can see, you can, you can, what is the word I'm looking for? Procrastinate. You can procrastinate so that you don't get anything done as it relates to your life, your living, or even your outreach to reaching your families as it relates to that. Okay? Now, I want you to think about something. What kind of excuses do we often make for not serving the Lord, for not sowing and trusting God for the harvest, uh, which is also known as good results? Okay, uh, what do we often say? What are some of the things that we say? We often say that we're too young to do it, or we say we're too old to do it, or we say we're too busy to do it, or we say we're too uneducated. I don't know what to say. I would say we're too ill-equipped. I don't know enough passages of scriptures. Don't pick me yet. I'm not ready yet. I need to get some more passages. I need to learn some more Bible. Okay, I'm not ready to do that yet. Uh, we will say that the timing isn't right, just like the passage was saying. And if we're not careful, we'll end up waiting a whole lifetime. And then we'll find that it's too late for the opportunity would have been missed. Okay, this is one of the things that he, Solomon is trying to get across in this particular passage. So now listen to this. As we live in this confusing world, God expects us to get busy for him. And I think that's important for us to understand. God, it's not that God wants us to get busy for him. It's not that God desires for us to get busy for him and do something. He expects us to do something. Okay? And that becomes important for us to understand. Now, uh, but I think it becomes important for us to be mindful of this reality. God knows what you know. And God knows what you don't know. Okay? He expects you to use that that you have. That one passage that you hang your hat on, use that one, okay? Uh, you know, uh, we were, many of us are old enough uh, to remember uh, the one prayer uh, that we used to, well, it ended up being a prayer. It was supposed to be a scripture, but it ended up being a prayer that we would pray over our food. It ended up being one of the shortest prayers and the shortest things we would say over our food, Jesus will, okay? And, and most of the time when people would say that, they didn't even know why. Okay, we just knew that that was in the Bible. Our food was in front of us. We were supposed to say something, and that's what we did, right? Okay, and so it becomes important for us to understand. But guess what? You can hang your hat around that one passage, because that's the Word of God, okay? You know, and put something else with it. So, I mean, don't feel discouraged if all you know is the 23rd Psalm, okay? Sure, should you, should you learn more? Sure you should. But if that's all you know, don't let that be a hindrance to you. Okay, talking about the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or the model prayer, okay, from the gospel. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. If those are the only passages you know, you know, don't be frustrated because of that. But true enough, do what you can to learn others, but don't let that stop you. Okay, use the passage, use what you have, and use what you know. And don't be ashamed uh, to do that, okay? Because God expects us to get busy for him, okay? God expects only for our faithfulness, and this is important because success or the harvest that comes is up to him. God does not expect you to be successful. God expects you to be faithful, okay? And, and he will give us good success from our faithfulness. I think sometimes we try too hard trying to be successful, and then we fail or get frustrated, okay? When God doesn't call on us to be successful. He's going to bring that success, okay? But he expects us to be faithful, okay? Any questions or comments? Okay, feel free. Okay, let us remember now what Paul said when he was inspired by God to tell the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. He says, I planted Apollo's water, but God gave growth or the increase, as it would say in the inerrant King James Version, okay? 
And, uh, and that is there's always something for someone to do. Just do your part, okay? And sometimes we don't get that, you know. Sometimes even in our evangelism and our outreach, we, we're witnessing to people, inviting people to church. And we invite them every week, and they don't come. And then somebody invite them one time, and they show up, okay? Well, you, your inviting is what broke up that ground. What you did is what put that in, okay? Because at the end of the day, they just need to come and worship God, okay? Whether it is because you said come with me or not, okay? But you don't stop because you don't get any results from it. And because that becomes important for us to understand because sometimes we can get uh, um, uh, exhausted or weary, as the scripture says, in the well-doing uh, of inviting people, of reaching out to people. For a number of reasons. Sometimes they flat out say no. Sometimes they don't tell the truth. Sometimes they all say, yeah, oh yeah, I'll see you, I'll see you, I'll see you. And then they don't answer the phone on Sunday, okay, or on Saturday, okay. Well, we all have been there, okay. But that doesn't get us, we should never get to the point where we simply say, well, i tell you what then, I ain't asking nobody. Because I get tired of hearing no, okay. I'm not, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not, not going to do it anymore. Because, listen, uh, the Bible teaches us what profit a person to gain the whole world and lose their own soul. Something you hear me say many, many times, eternity is a long time and hell is a real place, okay? And you don't get a do-over, okay? Regardless of what some faith traditions may try to tell us, okay? Ain't nobody gonna pray you out of that. Ain't nobody gonna pay you out of that, okay? Once the deal is done, uh, pardon me to use that word, but once, once it's over, Okay, your, your, your eternal direction is set once you die, and it cannot be changed after you die. Okay, uh, you know, well, we have scriptures to help us with that. You know, in the gospel, Jesus gives a parable about the rich man and Davies, and they both died. One went to hell, one went to Abraham's bosom. Okay, and no matter how the guy said, well, you know what, this was a bad idea. It was too late. Okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, so we have to kind of be mindful of that, all right? Okay. So now we continue on here. Now, listen again. Again, I want to revisit chapter 11 with verses 5 and 6. I'm going to read those for you. Just as you do not know the path of the wind or how bones are formed in the womb of the pregnant woman, so you do not know the activity of God who makes everything. Sow your seed in the morning and do not be idle in the evening, for you do not know whether one or the other will succeed or whether both of them alike will be good. Now, this becomes important because Solomon, again, is reminding us of the limitations of human knowledge, okay, especially as it relates to understanding the ways of God. I mean, how can we, you know, and Solomon has to have a sense of humor sometimes in the way he says this sort of thing. He says, now, how can you say you understand God and you don't even know how many bones in the human body, okay, or you don't know how bones form in the human body, okay, and things of this sort, and he kind of talks about some of those things, okay, because uh, that's how that's how God how far God's thoughts and ways are above our thoughts and ways. But listen, we in chapter eleven here, and this is Solomon saying this. But this is the same guy that some chapters ago or earlier in his life was saying he knew that. Okay, he knew what the answers were. Okay, and he felt that that was just it. What he said was it. Okay, but he came to understand that such is not the case. Okay, it becomes important for us to understand that, okay? Now, in the same way, we don't know all the things about the world or even humanity. We, we also do not know the works of God in any comprehensive way. We don't know why God does some of the things that he does or why God doesn't do some of the things that he does not do, okay? So, when we look at something like this in the Word here, we see that Solomon in this text now brings us to a place of humility and submission to God and his works. In other words, how we know it's like the hymn that says, How great thou art. Okay? I come to understand how great he is because I don't understand all the things that he does. Okay? Uh what's this what's the lady? Uh she used to sing the song and she says, uh, uh, how is it that a brown cow can eat green grass and then give out white milk that can turn into yellow butter? And they said, only a God can make all of that happen, okay? We can't understand. You would think milk should be green, okay? Or it should be something else, but it's not. And then what makes, what makes white milk turn into yellow butter, okay? Uh, all these things are beyond our comprehension, 
Okay, even those, those are some pretty plain things, but then there's even some more complex things as to God's allowance and providence and things of that sort that we need to, need to come to understand. So now, uh, this awareness pushes us out of the questionable faith of Solomon's previously entrenched under the sun premises. Because, you know, Solomon used to say, well, don't worry about it. Whatever's going to happen, go happen. This is just the way it is. God's going to do whatever God want to do. And all this kind of stuff in a very matter-of-fact, negative sort of uh, attitude when he said, no, we come to understand that our thoughts uh, don't come close to God's thoughts. And our ways don't come close to, to God's ways. He has a will and a way in which he does what he does. Okay? And things don't just randomly happen. Okay? And God is not unfair. Even when God does something or does not do something that we wanted him to do or didn't want him to do. Okay? Question or comments? Okay, very good. And those of you at home, if you want to type something in, you can type it in too. Okay? Now, while verse 7 and 8 brings us to the end of chapter 11, what do you mean, Reverend Jones? There's two more verses in chapter 11. That's true. But verses 7 and 8 actually brings us to the end of chapter 11. Because the remaining verses of 9 and 10 are actually the beginning of chapter 12, okay? And we understand this is not an unusual model because if any of you all are familiar with the gospel of John chapter 14, verse 1, it sounds like this. Uh, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He talks about in my father's house there are many mansions. And that's John chapter 14, verse 1. But in all reality, actually John chapter 13, verse 38 is actually connected to that, okay? Because here it is, is when uh, Peter says to Jesus in chapter 13 of the Gospel of John, you know, I'm willing to die for you. And then Jesus looks at him and says, before the, before the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me, okay? And then he says, but let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? That's all connected, even though it's been canon in two different sections. Well, that thought is one thought, just like this thought. Verses 7 and 8 is the end of chapter 11, and verses 9 and 10, as we will see, will take us into chapter 12 uh, of Ecclesiastes. So let's take a look at verses 7 and 8. The light is pleasant and is good for the eyes to see the sun. Indeed, if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. But let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. Everything that is to come will be futility. You know, now, listen, it becomes important for us to understand it like this. If God chooses to give us a long life, then we ought to rejoice in the years of that life. Now, you know society is telling us the other way around, okay? Well, you know, this old age is a monster, you know? Getting old ain't fun, and getting old is this, you know? And we don't do that, and you know, and we don't think about, because when we think about that, we're thinking about uh, not what God has provided for us, but what we can't do no more. Or what we can't do anymore. And so, you know, and so we come up with all kinds of terms about it. But if God chooses us to live a long life, we should rejoice in all those years of that life, even in old age. Because, listen, the longer we live, the more opportunity we have to serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't serve him, then you don't have nothing to do. <laughs> okay? And, you know, and, you know, and, you know, and that's very, very important because, you may have seen, and I have seen individuals who have uh, worked their lives, worked hard, long, and strong all their lives, and then they reach an age of retirement, and because they don't have nothing to do, the next thing you know, they're gone, okay? And you say, man, didn't he just retire week before last? Didn't he just retire last year? And he's gone, but had nothing to do. There was nothing to keep him going, okay? Because, well, that's it. I'm done, I'm useless, I'm old, okay? Don't nobody need me no more. But the longer we live, the more opportunity, brothers and sisters, that we have to serve the Lord. And we have more time to spend with our family and friends and to do the work that God has given us to do. Those things become important, and it becomes important for us to do, okay? Questions or comments? Okay, y'all, a couple of y'all look like a question. Look like a comment there. I want someone to open that up. Okay. All right. Now, moving on to page nine here. Because Solomon is a realist, he also says what we must remember in verse 8. And that's true, okay? Because he says that there are uh, days of darkness that does lead to old age. The aging process, as we all are beginning to know if we don't already, 
uh, begins to take a toll on the human body. And eventually this will lead to death. Okay? Which as Solomon always says is inevitable. Okay? As we live, we're going to die. Okay? Now, but this is important. Okay? Because uh, if you feel that you have no eternity to look forward to, uh, it makes the end of life vanity. And remember, for a while, Solomon was thinking about that. Well, you know, when you're dead, you're done. Okay? But we come to find out, thank God for the Christian, that's not the case because we look forward to eternity, to a life after this one. Okay? And an amen goes right there. Amen. I thank God that we have something to look forward to. It's not dead and you're done. Okay? Deacon Irby said, live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I'm going to give him the Star Trek sign on that one. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. So, uh, uh, and, and that's very true. And, uh, and uh, uh, interestingly enough, that's a frame of mind that we have to get ourselves into. Because, you know, a, a lot of people live long and complain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And so it becomes important for us to understand that. That, that life is worth living, but then we have to re, we have to make sure that we uh, uh, society understands, and we as African Americans have to learn to revisit uh, how we value uh, our seniors. Okay, and uh, we we used to value them. Okay, like other cultures value their seniors. Now we're in the sense of throwing them away. Okay, or getting them out of our faces, or getting them away from us, or or getting away from them. Okay, instead of valuing. Uh, the, the fact that we would be where they are, where we are without them. Mm -hmm. Okay? You know, they took us there, so it becomes important for us to understand that. So now, as we have seen, the confusing world of Solomon, and his so-called under-the-sun experience, had caused him to question his faith. And we've seen that throughout our studies of Ecclesiastes. But now we're going to see in the next verses of chapter 11 and the rest of chapter 12 how he comes to a conclusion of the matter, okay? And these are things that we must be mindful of as we face the challenges that can cause us to question our faith in a confusing world. So, let's listen to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. New American Standard Bible. Rejoice, young man, during your childhood, and let your heart be pleasant during the days of young manhood, and follow the impulses of your heart and the desires of your, uh, of your eyes. Yet know that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. So remove sorrow from your heart and keep pain away from your body because childhood and the prime of life are fleeting. Okay? Now, we can see here that Solomon now looked back from his old age to the days of his youth uh, before this under the sun premise took a toll on his life and his mind. And, and now he hopes for the better uh, for his young readers. And, and, have a, and isn't it interesting, and if we're not careful, we all do it, okay? Uh, and, and you hear people complaining about what young people do today, and then if you saw them in the 60s and the 70s, they was probably doing some of the same stuff, okay? But now we tend to act like, oh, no, uh, don't do that, uh, because we, we probably learned a lesson from it. But instead of teaching that there's a lesson to be learned from it, we act like we never did it, okay? And so some children think that we old people grew up old, okay? They, you know, they think, they think we grew up just what we are, and they know nothing about what we've experienced in our lives, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and, uh, which, which made us a better person because we're still here, made us a survivor because we're still here, okay? And so it becomes important for us to recognize that as we see in 11 chapters and a few verses, Solomon now begins to peel back from this invincible person and says, you know what, I better leave a legacy behind here. I better let some folk know that, you know, there's some things that you need to be careful about, but there's some things to look forward to, okay? Uh, there, there is a future, okay? And you can be in it, okay? That becomes important for us to understand, all right? So now, listen to the B clause of verse 9, where he says, Follow the impulses of your heart and the desires of your eyes, yet know that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. Listen, there's a lot there, but here Solomon comes to the answer of his premise and his book. He says it like this, listen, one may live according to their heart and by what they see, but they should not think that their own heart and eyes will be their judge. 
Okay? You can't be your own judge. Okay, not even in your own heart and your own mind. Okay, I'll never forget uh, 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 the former chairman from years past, uh, Deacon Venado, uh, used to say this about some people. He used to say, this person is a legend in their own mind. Okay, and still a legend in their own time, right? Okay, a legend in their own mind. And we got to make absolutely sure that as we live according to our heart and by what we see, that we should not think that what we believe and what we think and what we see is going to be our judge. Because there is a God, brothers and sisters, okay, who, as a, as my grandfather used to say, sits high and looks low, okay, who will bring all your life and works into judgment. He watches all that we have done, okay? It becomes important for us to understand that. So now, these are wise words of Solomon, and they're summed up like this. Do not let your heart lead you into sin, and do not satisfy the desires or the lust of your flesh. Okay? Those are wise words for a person who has come a long way. Okay? And experienced it and lived tell about it. Okay? And it becomes important for us to understand that. Instead, he says, walk in holiness and obedience to God's word because there is a day coming when all will give an account before God for how we have lived our lives. Okay? That's important for us to understand. The unfortunate reality is that sometimes it takes us a long time before we get there and realize it, okay? <laughs> okay? And uh, and we must come to understand that, okay? So now. So, question. Yes, sir. So it's not never too late, though, right? Right. It's never too late. It's, it's never too late. Uh, it, it's never too late. As long as you have breath in your body, there's opportunity, okay? And, uh, and it becomes important for us to understand that. Uh, remember, we, 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 people don't use it as an example as much anymore, but remember the thief on the cross, okay? He died on the cross, okay? Uh, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Today, you'll be with me. If you believe in your heart the Lord Jesus and confess with your mouth that God is raised from the dead, today, you are saved, okay? And so that becomes important for us to understand that. So we can see how a restored relationship with God has cleared Solomon's vision regarding life and how one will spend eternity. And that's important. It took, it took him a while to come to that conclusion, mm -hmm. okay? And he made a lot of missteps, okay, in getting to that conclusion. And there are a lot of people that do that same thing. They say, oh, I don't need God. I got money, I got health, I have friends, I have material things, I have possessions. I need God for what? Don't need God. And then there comes a time when they don't have that stuff. And guess what? Now they realize that they need God. But here's the good part. God will still take them. Okay? God will still. God won't say, oh, you didn't need me back then, huh? Oh, you're going to bring a little broke up self here to me now. You're not going to say that. Okay? He's going to say, come, just as you are. You know, and that's the beautiful thing about it. Okay? Now, listen to verse, the A, the a clause of verse 10. It says these words. So remove sorrow from your heart. It's a short piece, but I'm going to say it again. So remove sorrow from your heart. Listen, living in view of eternity and in the presence of God gives us hope for this life and for the life to come. It is the hope that will remove sorrow from your heart. Because you know, you know there's something better. You know where you're going, okay? It becomes important for us to understand no matter uh, how things are, you know, we know that things, there's a brighter day ahead. Oh, this must be a Deacon Venado memory day. Okay, because uh, he's the song he used to sing, there's a brighter day ahead, okay? And it becomes important for us to understand that. But you have to learn that through your experiences in other things that you have been through to come to understand that there's a brighter day ahead, okay? So now, listen to the B clause of verse 10. That's the A clause of verse 10. Listen to the B clause. And keep pain or evil away from your body. Now, again, living in view of eternity and in the presence of God also is an incentive to live a holy, godly life in our days on earth. Okay, listen, we know that our good will be rewarded and blessed, not only in this life, but in the life to come. And so we work hard to avoid the things that can hurt us. Okay, uh, uh, and, and there are some things that can hurt us that are good. Okay, they can be seen to be good to us. And it's become, but when we learn that, and so it's important to keep pain or keep the evil away from our body. Keep, uh, keep ourselves away from the stuff that can hurt us. I mean, that almost sounds like something that your doctor tells you, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Okay? And, uh, and so, you know, but, but, but it's real. 
Okay, the truth of it is real. Whether uh, you are reading it from the Bible, whether the preacher's preaching it or teaching it, or whether your doctor tells you, keep away, uh, keep pain or keep evil away from your body. Keep those things away from you that can bring harm to you. But then there's the last part of verse 10. It says these words, because childhood and the prime of life are fleeting. Before you know it, it's gone. Okay, uh, I look at uh, my grandchildren and how big they have gotten. Okay, I can remember. I can remember the one that that gave me my name, Paul. Okay, the first grandchild I had, twenty five years old, college graduate now. Okay, I, I can remember when she was just in in the chair eating, being fed food. Okay, I can remember that. Okay, just uh, you know, you before you know it, and that's just them. You know, and what about us? Okay, you think about. You know, the, the things we used to do and where we used to be and how we used to have it. Yeah. Okay, I'm looking for a picture. You all, you all might not believe it, but, you know, there was a time in my life when I had an S-curl flowing. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah, laugh, 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 laugh. Okay, oh, yeah, I kept luster, I I kept luster silk in business up here, man. I had, luster, I had that mustache coming around right there, and I had that flowing in the back. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm still trying to find that picture. I'm trying to find that picture. Uh, but, but before you know it, those days are gone, okay? And so in Solomon's questionable faith under the sun premise, childhood and youth uh, are all that matter. But we came to find out, and Solomon came to find out, that childhood and youth are the prime, are the prime of life, but they don't last always, Okay? Uh, when we live in a view of eternity and in the presence of God, uh, you know that things are going to get better, and, eat, and you know what you can't go back to, so you don't long to go back where you can't go, okay? Uh, you look forward to what's, what's ahead for you, okay? So now, hopefully having said that, I've been able to show you the realities of our world that cause Solomon to question uh, his faith and have caused many that we know, perhaps even ourselves, to question theirs. And so... We'll begin to see, uh, when we go into chapter 12, uh, the rest of it, because this opening was these two verses, is really the opening in chapter 12, believe it or not, verses 9 and 10. We'll begin to see how Solomon, being the wise man that he was, can learn, or did learn from his challenges while teaching us to learn from ours. Okay? As we continue to engage this topic, questioning our faith in a confusing world. Okay? All right, that's it. That's all for today. I hope it's been a blessing and a help to you. Uh, may God truly bless you and keep you. Let us remain prayerful for all of those who are sick and shut in. And let us remember to be thankful and prayerful for those whom God has returned to us and who he is constantly restoring. Let us close with our word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for allowing us this opportunity to come together. We ask you to continue to look on those who we stand ready to continually pray for. You know all about them, Master. You know where they're at and the conditions that they're in. Then, Lord, we want to take a moment to thank you for the blessings and the provisions that you provided for those who had been sick, for those who have made it safely through car accidents, those that have been through a number of things. Some of them we don't even know about, but you brought them through. You brought us through. We thank you for that. Lord, we ask you to continue to keep us now. Dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. It's in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. 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 God bless you. I'm praying about those who have been delivered from car accidents and brother figures come walking in the door. All right. All right. Okay. God bless you. And uh, take care. And God bless. All right. <laughs>